George Bernard Shaw wrote, In the Middle Ages, people believed that the earth was flat, for which they had at least the evidence of their senses. We believe it to be round, not because as many as one percent of us could give the physical reasons for so quaint a belief, but because modern science has convinced us that nothing that is obvious is true, and that everything that is magical, improbable, extraordinary, gigantic, microscopic, heartless, or outrageous is scientific. Modern astronomy has absolutely convinced the world, as George Bernard Shaw stated, that nothing that is obvious is true. It is obvious that the earth is flat, yet they say it is curved, it is obvious that the world is motionless, yet they say that it moves. It is obvious that the heavens revolve around us, yet they say it is us that revolves. It is obvious that the stars are stars, yet they say the stars are suns. It is obvious that the sun is bigger than the stars, yet they say the stars are bigger than the sun. It is obvious that the sun and moon are the same size, yet they say the sun is four hundred times larger. It is obvious that Earth is the only planet, yet they say there are over a septillion planets. It is obvious that up is up and down is down, yet they say it is not so. David Wardlaw Scott said, with the modern astronomer, there is theoretically neither up nor down, though his experience belies his assertion every time he looks up to the heavens or down to the ground. Such aberration of intellect is really to be pitied. William Carpenter wrote, Astronomer Denison Olmsted, in describing a diagram which is supposed to represent the Earth as a globe, with a figure of a man sticking out at each side and one hanging head downwards, says, we should dwell on this point until it appears to us as truly up in the direction given to these figures as it does with regard to a figure which he has placed on the top. Now a system of philosophy which requires us to do something which is really the going out of our minds by dwelling on an absurdity until we think it is a fact cannot be a system based on God's truth which never requires anything of the kind. Since then the popular theoretical astronomy of the day requires this, it is evident that it is the wrong thing, and that this conclusion furnishes us with a proof that the earth is not a globe. S. G. Fowler wrote, The physical properties of a physical globe would create insurmountable difficulties for the being called man, for man is a two-legged, smooth-footed, clawless toad, and heavily built creature. Picture him on the outside of a sphere in our popular 34 degrees south latitude. He has his boots on and his head is depressed in space 34 degrees to his feet. Consider him magnetized through his boots to the center of the globe, where the big magnet is located. Picture him looking down into the gaseous void with his eyes gouging out of their sockets and his heart in his mouth and his prayer that his hobnailed boots will not lose their magnetism. No wonder the world's got brain-addled. The reader has been hoaxed by the stupidest manifest hoax ever perpetrated. It should be obvious that up truly is up, and down truly is down, that flat truly is flat, and still truly is still. It should be obvious the universe was intelligently designed by an intelligent designer, purposefully created by a purposeful creator. Yet modern science and astronomy, through centuries of deception and manipulation, have obfuscated the obvious and left people blinded to the simple truth. E. Eschini wrote, The one thing the fable of the revolving earth has done, it has shown the terrible power of a lie. A lie has the power to make a man a mental slave, so that he dares not back the evidence of his own senses to deny the plain and obvious movement of the sun he sees before him, when he feels himself standing on an earth utterly devoid of motion, at the suggestion of someone else he is prepared to accept that he is spinning furiously around, when he sees a bird flying and gaining over the ground, he is prepared to believe that the ground is really traveling a great number of times faster than the bird. Finally, in order to uphold the imagination of a madman, he is prepared to accuse his maker of forming him a censiferous lie. The truth is, 
that the earth is not a planet. It is a plane. Other than the heights and depths of mountains and valleys, the earth has no curvature or convexity, and is for all intents and purposes flat. Just as it appears, the sun, moon, and stars, fixed and wandering, all revolve around the flat earth, which is the stationary, immovable center of the universe. The magnetic north pole is the center of the earth and the universe. Polaris, the north pole star, remains always significantly situated atop the dome of the heavens, while the sun, moon, and stars revolve in circular cycles around us. The truth is that all standing water is always flat, the horizon is always flat, and all canals, tunnels, and railways are built without regard for the supposed curvature or convexity of the earth. The light from lighthouses can be seen at incredible distances, only possible on a flat surface. The truth is, pilots do not make constant nose declinations or compensation acceleration to account for the supposed curvature and rotation of the ball earth. The truth is, sailors do not use spherical calculations, but plane trigonometry when navigating. David Wardlaw Scott wrote, Rational people believe Salisbury Plain to be a plane, and Lake Windermere to be horizontal. But our astronomers say that this is all a mistake, that we must not trust our eyes when we see these or other such places as being horizontal, but that we should believe what they tell us, that Salisbury Plain, Lake Windermere, and also all other plains, lakes, and places upon the earth, as well as the vast Pacific and all other oceans, are only parts of a great globe, and therefore must have a curve, besides which, mirable dictu, that all rush together round the sun at the rate of 65,000 miles per hour. They give their law for this fancied curvature, based on the world being 25,000 miles in circumference at the equator, as being 8 inches for the first mile, 2 feet 8 inches for the second, 6 feet for the third, and so on, the rule being to square the number of miles between the observer and the object, then multiply that square by 8 inches, and divide by 12 to bring it into feet, the quotient being the supposed curvature. Unfortunately, however, for astronomers, this theory does not agree with fact, for this rule of curvature has been found to be utterly fallacious, both on land and water. All houses have to be built on level ground, but no allowance whatever is made for the curvature of the earth, and all compasses point north and south at the same time, even at the equator, which incontestably proves that the sea is horizontal, and therefore that the world is not globular, for if it were, one end of the magnet would then dip towards the north pole, and the other point to the heavens. The truth is that Antarctica is a giant ice wall holding in the oceans, and the South Pole does not exist. Various anomalies and differences between the Arctic and Antarctic prove the Earth is not a ball. The Arctic midnight sun proves the universe is geocentric. The truth is the sun and moon are equal divine balanced opposites made for signs and seasons to light the Earth and divide day from night. The moon is not merely a reflector of the sun's light, but emanates a demonstrably unique light of its own. It is completely self-luminescent and semi-transparent. The truth is that man has not and cannot ever walk on the moon or Mars, because the heavenly bodies are simply luminaries and not terrestrial terra firma like the earth. The moon and Mars landings were and are all hoaxes staged and filmed by Freemasons on Earth. Orbiting satellites and space stations do not exist. All video and photographs you have ever seen from NASA, Hubble, and other official sources are all CGI, computer-generated images. Gravity does not exist, and all floating astronauts are simply using wires or filming aboard zero-g planes. Relativity does not exist, and that is why Einstein is always sticking his tongue out at you. The truth is, the universe was intelligently designed by an intelligent designer, purposefully created by a purposeful creator, not the haphazard result of some inexplicable cosmic accident. 
The truth is that life, consciousness, the incredible, beautiful diversity and complexity of nature is divinely created, not coldly, blindly evolved out of nothing. Dr. Woodhouse wrote, When we consider what the advocates of the Earth's stationary and central position can account for, and explain their celestial phenomena as accurately to their own thinking as we can ours, in addition to which they have the evidence of their senses and scripture and facts in their favor, which we have not, it is not without a show of reason that they maintain the superiority of their system. However perfect our theory may appear in our own estimation, and however simply and satisfactorily the Newtonian hypothesis may seem to us to account for all the celestial phenomena, yet we are here compelled to admit the astonishing truth if our premises be disputed and our facts challenged, the whole range of astronomy does not contain one proof of its own accuracy. Reverend John Wesley wrote, The more I consider them, the more I doubt all systems of astronomy. I doubt whether we can with certainty know either the distances or the magnitude of any star in the firmament, else why do astronomers so immensely differ with the regard to the distance of the sun from the earth? some affirming it to be only three, and others ninety million miles away. Thomas Winship wrote, Many have been able to see through the delusions of modern astronomy. Letters from various parts testify that, in some cases, men and women have begun to make use of their brain power, which had been stunted and dwarfed by acceptation, without the slightest proof of the unscientific, unreasonable, unnatural, and infidel teachings of men foisted upon a credulous public in the name of science. Others, again, tell that the writers have thrown to the moles and to the bats the worldwide and almost universally believed hoax that we are living on a whirling sea-earth globe, revolving faster than a cannonball travels, rushing through space at a rate beyond human power to conceive, and flying with the whole of the so-called solar system in another direction twenty times the speed of its own rotation. In conspiracy research, the term globalist usually refers to internationalists, people in favor of a one-world order, but more literally and more accurately, as the UN World Government logo shows, the term globalist signifies those who propagate the centuries-old myth of a globe Earth. Heliocentrism and the ball Earth mythos have long been promoted by Masonic patriarchal pagan sun worshippers. In typical sun-worshipping fashion, the sun was made to be the most important and central entity of the so-called solar system. The earth was demoted to being a mere planet, like the wandering stars. All the fixed stars were turned into distant suns as well. The sun was said to be the only giver of light, and the moon demoted to a mere reflector of the sun's light. The sun was said to be the largest thing in our corner of the galaxy bigger than the Earth, Moon, and planets. By removing Earth from the motionless center of the universe, these Masons have moved us physically and metaphysically from a place of supreme importance to one of complete nihilistic indifference. If the Earth is the center of the universe, then the ideas of God, creation, and a purpose for human existence are resplendent. But if the Earth is just one of billions of planets revolving around billions of stars and billions of galaxies, then the ideas of God, creation, and a specific purpose for Earth and human existence become highly implausible. By surreptitiously indoctrinating us into their scientific materialist sun worship, not only do we lose faith in anything beyond the material, we gain absolute faith in materiality, superficiality, status, selfishness, hedonism, and consumerism. If there is no God and everyone is just an accident, then all that really matters is me, me, me. They have turned Madonna, the mother of God, into a material girl living in a material world. Their rich, powerful corporations with slick sun cult logos sell us idols to worship, slowly taking over the world while we tacitly believe their science, vote for their politicians, buy their products, listen to their music, watch their movies, sacrificing our souls at the altar of materialism. David Wardlaw Scott wrote, Such discrepancies remind me of the confusion which attended those who in olden days attempted to build the Tower of Babel, when their language was confounded and their labor brought to naught. But no wonder is it that their calculations are all wrong, seeing they proceeded from a wrong basis. 
They assumed the world to be a planet with a circumference of 25,000 miles, and took their measurements from its supposed center, and from supposed spherical angles of measurement on the surface. Again, how could such measurements possibly be correct while, as we are told, the Earth was whirling around the sun faster than a cannonball, at the rate of 18 miles per second, a force more than sufficient to kill every man, woman, and child on its surface in less than a minute, then the earth is supposed to have various other motions, into the discussion of which I need not enter here, and will only notice that of its supposed rotation round its imaginary axis at the rate at the equator of a thousand miles per hour, with an inclination of 23.5 degrees. E. S. Shini wrote, Ptolemy had made it appear that the sun and stars revolved around a stationary earth, but Copernicus advanced the theory that it was the earth which revolved around a stationary sun, while the stars were fixed, and either of these entirely opposite theories gives an equally satisfactory explanation of the appearance of the sun by day and the stars by night. Copernicus did not produce any newly discovered fact to prove that Ptolemy was wrong, neither did he offer any proof that he himself was right, but worked out his system to show that he could account for all the appearances of the heavens quite as well as the Egyptians had done, though working on an entirely different hypothesis, and offered his new heliocentric theory as an alternative. Ptolemy shows very ingeniously that the earth must be at the center of the celestial sphere. He proves that unless this were the case, each star would not move with the absolute uniformity which does characterize it. He shows also that the earth could not be animated by any movement of transition. The earth, argued Ptolemy, lies at the center of the celestial sphere. If the earth were to be endowed with movement, it would not lie always at this point. It must therefore shift to some other part of the sphere. The movements of the stars, however, preclude this, and therefore the earth must be as devoid of any movement of translation as it is of rotation. The Ptolemaic geocentric system prevailed for over 1400 years, and even thousands of years before Ptolemy, flat earth geocentricism was the widely accepted truth. The modern ball earth heliocentricism popularized by the likes of Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, and NASA, however, is a comparatively recent belief system that has been foisted upon an unsuspecting world for 500 years. Ptolemy never imagined the scientific magicians of the future would be so brazen, nor the public so gullible, as to accept that we see no parallax change in the stars after hundreds of millions of miles of supposed orbital motion, simply because all those stars are trillions upon trillions of miles further distant at a sufficient enough scale for no change in relative parallax to occur. How convenient! Yet another fact of modern astronomy which defies our common sense and experience. Lady Blunt wrote, They expect us to believe that the earth and sea together comprise a flying globe, which they speak of as a solid orb, supposed by astronomers to have been originally shot off the sun in a soft plastic mass, which as the temperature decreased, gradually solidified. Yet not one single fact or proof can they produce for this far-fetched idea, and in spite of the fact that the whirling globe theory was, even according to the open confessions of its founders, set forth to the world in the first instance as a mere supposition, it is now presented as unquestionable truth. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, It was said in effect by Newton, and has ever since been insisted upon by his disciples, Allow us, without proof, which is impossible, the existence of two universal forces, centrifugal and centripetal, or attraction and repulsion, and we will construct a theory which shall explain all the leading phenomena and mysteries of nature, an apple falling from a tree, or a stone rolling downwards, and a pail of water tied to a string and set in motion, were assumed to be types of the relations existing among all the bodies in the universe. The moon was assumed to have a tendency to fall towards the earth, and the earth and moon together towards the sun. The same relation was assumed to exist between all the smaller and larger luminaries in the firmament, and it soon became necessary to extend these assumptions to infinity. The universe was parceled out into systems, coexistent and illimitable, 
suns, planets, satellites, and comets were assumed to exist infinite in number and boundless in extent, and to enable the theorists to explain alternating and constantly recurring phenomena which were everywhere observable, these numberless and forever extending objects were assumed to be spheres. The earth we inhabit was called a planet, and because it was thought to be reasonable that the luminous objects in the firmament, which were called planets, were spherical and had motion, so it was only reasonable to suppose, as the earth was a planet, it must also be spherical and have motion. Ergo, the earth is a globe and moves upon axes and in an orbit around the sun. And as the earth is a globe and is inhabited, so again it is only reasonable to conclude that the planets are worlds like the earth and are inhabited by sentient beings. What reasoning! What shameful perversion of intellectual gifts! Gabrielle Henriette wrote, Copernicus put forward the hypothesis of the revolution of the earth round the sun in order to explain the cycle of the seasons. His theory is not very satisfactory, seeing that the earth is supposed to be at its greatest distance from the sun in the summer during the hot weather, and at its shortest distance in the winter when the temperature is at its lowest. These unusual conditions which clearly contradict the laws of nature as regard the effects of heat are, it is said, due to the angle formed by the rays of sun as they fall on the earth's surface. It is also stated that the opposition of the seasons north and south of the equator is due to a tilt of the earth first on one side and then on the other, which conveniently occurs at the right moment. Nothing is said, however, of the shifting of the waters of the sea and rivers which this change in the center of gravity and in the position of the earth would inevitably bring twice a year. It might also be assumed that, under those conditions, very high constructions would swerve from the vertical. The American skyscrapers and the Eiffel Tower, for instance, cannot be seen to lean right or left according to the seasons, although this should be a logical and natural consequence of the alternate inclination attributed to the earth. If the earth were a sphere that rotated daily on its vertical axis at a uniform velocity, revolving annually around the sun, it would follow that half the globe would always be sunlit, while the other half dark, every place on the globe receiving an equal amount of day and night. In actuality, however, the drastically varying lengths of day and night over the earth are consistent with the geocentric flat earth model. If the earth were a sphere, it would follow that the seasons the world over would be simultaneous due to the distance from the sun. When the earth is farthest away from the sun, the entire globe should be ensconced in winter and recording the coldest temperatures for the year. When the earth is closest to the sun, the entire globe should be summery and recording the warmest temperatures for the year. In actuality, however, this is not the case. The frozen depths of Antarctica remain forever frigidly foreboding, while just a few thousand miles away it is tropical summer. How is it that the heat from the sun could supposedly come from an eyebrow raising 93 million miles away to simultaneously burn the skin of beach bums in Hawaii while leaving Antarctic explorers frozen in their boots just a few thousand miles away? Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, it is geometrically demonstrable that all the visible luminaries in the firmament are within a distance of a few thousand miles from the earth, not more than the space which stretches between the North Pole and the Cape of Good Hope. And the principle of measurement, that of plane triangulation, with invariably and accurately measured baseline, which demonstrates this important fact, is one which no mathematician claiming to be a master in the science will for a moment deny. All these luminaries, then, and the sun itself, being so near to us, cannot be other than very small as compared with the earth we inhabit. They are all in motion over the earth, which is alone immovable, and therefore they cannot be anything more than secondary and subservient structures continually ministering to this fixed world and its inhabitants. This is a plain, simple, and in every respect demonstrable philosophy agreeing with the evidence of our senses borne out by every fairly instituted experiment, and never requiring a violation of those principles of investigation which the human mind has ever recognized and depended upon in its everyday life. The modern or Newtonian astronomy has none of these characteristics. The whole system taken together constitutes a most monstrous absurdity. It is false in its foundation, irregular, unfair, and illogical in its details and in its conclusions, inconsistent and contradictory, 
Worse than all, it is a prolific source of irreligion and of atheism, of which its advocates are practically supporters. By defending a system which is directly opposed to that which is taught in connection with the Jewish and Christian religion, they lead the more critical and daring intellects to question and deride the cosmogony and general philosophy contained in the sacred books. Because the Newtonian theory is held to be true, they are led to reject the scriptures altogether, to ignore the worship and doubt and deny the existence of a creator and supreme ruler of the world. The facts and experiments already advanced render it undeniable that the surface of all the waters of the earth is horizontal, and that however irregular the upper outline of the land itself may be, the whole mass, land and water together, constitutes an immense, non-moving, circular plain. If we travel by land or sea from any part of the earth in the direction of any meridian line and towards the northern central star called Polaris, we come to one and the same place, a region of ice, where the star which has been our guide is directly above us, or vertical to our position. This region is really the center of the earth, and recent observations seem to prove that it is a vast central tidal sea, nearly a thousand miles in diameter, and surrounded by a great wall or barrier of ice eighty to a hundred miles in breadth. If from this central region we trace the outline of the lands which project or radiate from it, and the surface of which is above the water, we find that the present form of the earth or dry land as distinguished from the waters of the great deep is an irregular mass of capes, bays, and islands, terminating in great bluffs or headlands, projecting principally towards the south, or at least in a direction away from the great northern center. If now we sail with our backs continually to this central star Polaris, or the center of the earth's surface, we shall arrive at another region of ice. Upon whatever meridian we sail, keeping the northern center behind us, we are checked in our progress by vast and lofty cliffs of ice. If we turn to the right or to the left of our meridian, these icy barriers beset us during the whole of our passage. Hence we have found that there is a great ebbing and flowing sea at the earth's center with a boundary wall of ice, that springing or projecting from this icy wall, irregular masses of land stretch out towards the south, where a desolate waste of turbulent waters surrounds the continents, and is itself engirdled by vast belts and packs of ice, bounded by immense frozen barriers, the lateral depth and extent of which are utterly unknown. How far the ice extends, how it terminates, and what exists beyond it, are questions to which no present human experience can reply. All we at present know is that snow and hail, howling winds and indescribable storms and hurricanes prevail, and that in every direction human ingress is barred by unsealed escarpments of perpetual ice extending farther than eye or telescope can penetrate and becoming lost in gloom and darkness. What remains unknown at this time are the extent of the Antarctic ice wall, how far can one travel southwards atop the ice, is it just water, snow, ice, and darkness forever? Or is there some limit, like the glass wall in the Truman Show? Is there a limit to space? Is the universe infinite, or as the Bible claims, contained within a physical firmament, the vault of heaven? What exists beneath the mighty deep? Is it just deeper and darker water, going downward forever? Or is there some limit? Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, if the earth is a distinct structure standing in and upon the waters of the great deep, it follows that unless it can be shown that something else sustains the waters, that the depth is fathomless. As there is no evidence whatever of anything existing underneath the great deep, and as in many parts of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans no bottom has been found by the most scientific and efficient means which human ingenuity could invent, we are forced to the conclusion that the depth is boundless. Gabrielle Henriette wrote, From the earliest times it has been believed and said that the heavens were not an empty space, but a solid surface. The Chaldeans and Egyptians regarded the sky as the massive cover of the world, and in India and Persia it was thought to be a metallic lid, flat or convex, or even pyramidal. Up to the 17th century, the earth was always regarded as the center of an empty sphere with solid walls, and on this account, it was always represented with a cover. This indispensable complement, however, was eliminated upon the advent of the theory of gravitation. For convenience sake, 
as a solid dome limiting the space round the earth would have rendered impossible the extravagant motions of the planets which were sent revolving in the air at phenomenal distances thus from this time the fact universally accepted for thousands of years that the sky is a firm surface completely disappeared nevertheless the possible existence of a solid vault over the earth is a question of great importance in view of the tremendous consequences which would result from this fact if it happened to be true there is no doubt that the general reaction is one of incredulity but on the other hand it can be considered that it is not without reason that the ancients believed in the existence of the material vault of heaven nor without reason either that this notion should have been consistently handed down through the ages since the earliest times up to the seventeenth century in all parts of the world the planets are not solid opaque masses of matter as is believed they are simply immaterial luminous and transparent disks and in view of these circumstances it is plain that the craters asperities mountains and valleys which were thought to exist on the surface of these imaginary masses are the topographic features of the solid vault of the sky which are illuminated and thrown into relief by the luminous and transparent disks which we call planets it is also to be realized that the lens of the telescope creates an appearance of convexity which standing out in relief conveys the impression of a spherical mass, but this convexity effect is merely an optical illusion. Flat earthers historically have been subject to not only intense ridicule and ostracism, but many have even been threatened and assaulted for espousing their beliefs. I have personally been threatened by Freemasons on multiple occasions for my work exposing their conspiracies, hoaxes, and manipulations. International Flat Earth Research Society President Charles K. Johnson claimed a man from NASA attempted to murder him, and later had a massive suspicious fire that burned his house down, the result of arson, which destroyed his entire Flat Earth library, all records and contacts of Flat Earth Society members. The most renowned Flat Earther in modern times, Dr. Samuel Robotham, also had his fair share of violent opposition. He stated that, For the long period of thirty-one years, I have labored single-handedly to bring this important subject before the world both on the lecture platform and in local journals, and traveling from place to place, never resting longer than a few months in one locality, but like a scientific philosophic gypsy, breaking up his tent and pitching it here and there and everywhere, in order to draw this great question to the attention of all classes and degrees of intelligence, and as matter of course, I have had to bear every possible form of opposition, the bitterest denunciations, often amounting to threats of violence and personal danger, the foulest misrepresentations, the most reckless calumny, and the wildest and most desperate efforts to stay my career and counteract my teachings. It has become a duty, paramount and imperative, to meet them in open, avowed, and unyielding rebellion, to declare that their unopposed reign of error and confusion is over, and that henceforth, like a falling dynasty, they must shrink and disappear, leaving the throne and the kingdom to those awakening intellects whose numbers are constantly increasing and whose march is rapid and irresistible. The soldiers of truth and reason have drawn the sword, and ere another generation has been educated, will have forced the usurper to abdicate. Go, throat. It may be boldly asked, where can the man be found possessing the extraordinary gifts of Newton? who could suffer himself to be deluded by such a hocus-pocus if he had not in the first instance willfully deceived himself. Only those who know the strength of self-deception and the extent to which it sometimes trenches on dishonesty are in a condition to explain the conduct of Newton and of Newton's school. To support his unnatural theory, Newton heaps fiction upon fiction, seeking to dazzle where he cannot convince. In whatever way or manner may have occurred this business, I must still say that I curse this modern theory of cosmogony, and hope that perchance there may appear, in due time, some young scientist of genius who will pick up the courage enough to upset this universally disseminated delirium of lunatics. David Wardlaw Scott wrote, 
I could easily cite other good authorities to similar effect, but I think enough have been already given to show that the absurdities of modern astronomy have not been palmed upon the world without a strong protest from thoughtful minds, and I sincerely trust that the following pages may prove useful to some honest thinkers, not only in exposing the fallacies of this chimerical science, but in showing the true position of the world as proved by facts in nature. I sincerely trust that, after considering the evidence which has been brought before him, the thoughtful reader will clearly see that this world of ours is not a planet, as supposed by our modern astronomers, but a real terra firma, founded upon the waters of the great deep, from which come and to which return with unceasing flow the rivers of the earth, in accordance with the wise and beneficent purpose of our divine creator. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, Thus we see that this Newtonian philosophy is devoid of consistency. Its details are the result of an entire violation of the laws and legitimate reasoning, and all its premises are assumed. It is, in fact, nothing more than assumption upon assumption, and the conclusions derived therefrom are willfully considered as things proved, and to be employed as truths to substantiate the first and fundamental assumptions. Such a juggle and jumble of fancies and falsehoods extended and intensified as in theoretical astronomy is calculated to make the unprejudiced inquirer revolt with horror from the terrible conjuration which has been practiced upon him, to sternly resolve and to resist its further progress, to endeavor to overthrow the entire edifice, and to bury in its ruins the false honors which have been associated with its fabricators, and which still attach to its devotees. For the learning, the patience, the perseverance and devotion for which they have ever been examples, honor and applause need not be withheld, but their false reasoning, the advantages they have taken of the general ignorance of mankind in respect to astronomical subjects, and the unfounded theories they have advanced and defended, cannot be otherwise than regretted, and ought to be, by every possible means, uprooted. The globe earth lie or what I have titled the Flat Earth Conspiracy, is in my humble opinion the greatest deception in human history and most important taboo issue which desperately needs to be exposed. If people knew the extent to which they have been lied to and brainwashed from birth, there would be a veritable revolution in critical thinking, personal sovereignty, and belief in God by morning. The New World Order globalists or Satan's prophesied one-world government, Masonic minions are everywhere, spreading their scientific disinformation, deceiving the very elect, and herding the sheeple to their slaughter. Please help spread the word to your friends, family, neighbors, and co-workers. Direct them to AtlanteanConspiracy.com and Eifers.ace.st and send them copies of this book to help awaken them and support my lifelong efforts to bring truth, freedom, peace, and love to the flat earth.